Hi, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us for today's Employment Readiness Webinar. I'm State Representative Tom Demmer. I'm joined by my colleague, Representative Jeff Kiker, and uh, we also have a number of um, special guests joining us throughout today's webinar to help you uh, understand what jobs are available in our area and some of the skills and resources that you can use uh, during your job search. Um, uh, again, I'm, I'm State Representative Tom Demmer. I live in Dixon. I represent parts of uh, Lee, Ogle, DeKalb, and LaSalle counties. It's the 90th legislative district, and I've been in office since 2013. And um, I'm, I'm glad to be partnering this morning with uh, my colleague to the east, my neighbor to the east, uh, Representative Jeff Kiker. And, you know, before I turn it over to Jeff, I just I, I want to uh, say thank you to everybody who's part of this webinar today both our presenters, but also everyone who's attending or watching this webinar. Um, I know how challenging it can be sometimes to find a job that's a right match for you, that, that fits your skill set, that gives you a good opportunity to support yourself and your family. And uh, part of that, part of taking that first step and finding that um, good fit is participating in employment readiness webinars like this. And so Jeff and I are very pleased to be able to bring these resources to you. And uh, we wish all of you the, the very best as you develop the skills and the resources you need to find a good job that you'll be productive in and you'll love for, for many years to come. And so thank you and, and uh, best wishes to you as you continue your job search. Uh, but to kick things off, well, why don't I turn it over to my colleague, Representative Jeff Kiker. Thank you, Tom, and good morning, everybody. Um, as you can tell, I am actually not in my state office. Uh, I am Jeff Kiker, though. I represent the 70th district, and I'm actually at a, uh, a job improvement uh, conference right now. So um, I, one of the things I want to concentrate on as you're going through this process today is uh, lifelong learning, making sure that you're constantly going through a self-improvement process. And, and I think we all should do that from time to time. It's something I believe in. And um, I'm excited to go downstairs after this seminar today and learn a little bit more about my profession uh, and the changes we've seen. I do represent the 70th district, which is portions of DeKalb, Boone, and Kane counties. I'm a proud graduate of Northern Illinois University and a small business owner with tw over 20 years of professional experience in the insurance industry. Uh, I live in Sycamore with my wife and family. And uh, a couple things to note as you're getting ready for today. If you have a question during any of the presenters, uh, talk, there will be a chat box. If you look on your screen, you'll see the little chat box and go ahead and type those answers in there. And as we as we hit natural breaks in the discussion, um, they'll go ahead and be able to answer those for you. So um, let's get started. I don't want to keep you any longer than, uh, than we need to. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Amanda Cost with the employment Employer and Career Development Specialist. She's at Kishwaukee College. She works directly with students and alumni to assist with job and internship placement, as well as collaborates with employers to fill available positions. Um, Amanda's been there with six years of experience in higher education and social services, providing leadership and guidance with career readiness initiatives. So uh, Amanda, over to you. Thank you for that introduction. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, so we have quite a few topics to talk about today in terms of um, employability skills, which is really exciting. Um, we will be talking about uh, job searching online, so digital, digital job searching, as well as digital interviewing. Um, those two things are pretty much here to stay, I think. Um, the interviewing digitally um, opposed to in-person as well as the um, job searching, which was still pretty relevant before the pandemic. Um, and then we will also be talking about LinkedIn just a little bit. So we have a lot of topics to cover. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to pop those into the Q&A at the bottom. Um, I will do my best to get through them as we go along. Um, otherwise, I will try to get to all of them at the end.
So before we get started on the topics, I just want to share one really great resource that is available for job seekers. Um, again, I work at Kishwaukee College in Career Services. Um, a part of the college, we also hold the WIOA Adult and Youth Grants. Um, our DeKalb Workforce Development Office is located in DeKalb, and it is a really great resource for any job seekers who might be looking for employment. Um, they have a uh, Career Resource Center where you can walk in and get assistance with job applications. You can get assistance with putting a resume together. If you have an interview coming up, they can assist you with preparing for that interview. Um, they also offer case management services. So if you kind of need that one-on-one -on -one guidance, someone to really help you find a job, they're available to assist you with that. Um, and they can offer up to $10,000 for any job seekers to go back to school and get a credential or degree in a field that's in high demand and pays pretty well. So if you've been laid off due to the pandemic and you're kind of looking for that career change and you're not sure where to go, this is a really good place and it's at no cost to job seekers. So um, for more information on that, you can visit the URL at the bottom, the kish.edu slash DWDO. Again, that's kish.edu slash DWDO. So we'll kind of jump right into job, digital job searching. Um, so I know job searching isn't the most fun thing to do in the world, but it is very important if you want to gain employment. Um, before you start your job search, it's really important to kind of create a job searching strategy. Um, it's kind of a smart thing to do before you jump into any big project and job searching is a pretty big project to do. Um, so sit, sit down with yourself and kind of think, you know, when can I do this job searching? Like what, what day works best for me? What time of day works best for me? I know for me, sometimes I'm more of an afternoon person than a morning person. So if I was job searching, I would want to make sure I block off that time in the afternoon. Now, it's important to remember that businesses typically operate between you know, the hours of 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So if you're a really late night person, you might want to try to adjust your schedule a little bit so you can do that job search during the day. Um, also focusing on what industries are you interested in and even just writing down five to seven companies you want to work for. I know, for example, if you are interested in working in healthcare, maybe writing down the five top hospitals or clinics you want to work for and then actually checking on their employment page about once a week. Sometimes companies will post on their company website first before they post on those big job boards like Indeed and Monster. So um, if you kind of have that organized and you can kind of check that company website on a weekly basis, it kind of puts you one step ahead of the game. So you can kind of see those before they get out there. Um, I, know, I know it's really important to kind of keep reminding yourself week to week kind of what your goals are. So maybe you can write down your long-term goals. You know, someday I do want to work in a large scale hospital, but for now, maybe I want to look for jobs in smaller clinics. Um, you know, write that down, visualize it, and then put it somewhere where you're going to see it every day. So maybe on the front of your fridge. I know for me, I would probably want to put that on the front of my coffee maker because I drink coffee every morning and that motivates me. Um, in your wallet, in your car, just anywhere where you're going to see that every day so you can remind yourself the things you need to do. Also, whenever we're doing digital job searching, it's important to kind of be mindful of the digital black hole. That's what I call it. So um, the digital black hole is basically where 70% of resumes go online. So if you're a job seeker and you're applying for a job, you put your resume in, you know, you're waiting for a call back. 70% of the time, a human being never looks at your resume. That's kind of scary when you think about it. Um, and it's important to know that. So I'm not giving you this information to scare you, but there are some tips that you can use to kind of help your resume get into that 30%, get um, into the hands of a human being. So that way you can get that job interview. So how does your resume get into the digital black hole? So sometimes you kind of need to know the why so that we can prevent that. So sometimes it means that your application materials were not tailored for that specific position. So maybe if you are applying for jobs in different industries um, and you do not tailor your resume or your cover letter for the industry you're applying for, then sometimes it kind of slips through the cracks. Um, we have applicant tracking systems to blame for that. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. You did not follow the instructions when applying. So when you're looking at a job, it's really important to see when the deadline is. So if the deadline is you know, July 1st and you apply for it on July 4th, 
they might not be able to see it or it might already be closed. Um, also, when in that job description, if they say resume and cover letter required and you don't upload a resume and cover letter, that application is probably going to go in the trash. So make sure you're really reading that job description, you're understanding what's required of you as a job seeker, and you're filling all of those requirements up front. Um, sometimes the position has already been filled, so every once in a while when we get our application in, kind of towards the end of that deadline, uh, Every once in a while, sometimes an employer already has someone in mind, maybe they already interviewed that person and they just haven't taken it down yet. So that doesn't always happen, but occasionally it does. Um, and then the last bullet point, you did not follow up. So that's a really big one I've noticed with job seekers. Sometimes we get really focused on putting as much applications out as we can. We focus on the quantity rather than the quality. So it's really important to kind of record everywhere you've been applying and then follow up with that employer, you know, about five to 10 business days after you put that application in. So again, it definitely depends on when that deadline is. So maybe you need to write down the date you applied, the date the deadline is, and then you can write your own date on when you're gonna follow up and then you can build that into your calendar. So we're going to talk about applicant tracking systems just a little bit. So when we talked about that digital black hole, this is probably the main thing, um, the main reason for that digital black hole. It, it's also the main reason why human beings don't always read our resumes or our job applications. Um, applicant tracking systems is something that has been around for quite some time, um, but it is getting smarter and better, um, you know, as we um, progress in technology. It's kind of with everything with AI. AI is starting to get a little bit smarter and it's starting to read things a little bit more clearly. Um, but basically applicant tracking systems are designed to pick out keywords in your resume, in your cover letter, and in your application. And then it kind of flags that for the employer or it might give you a score or it might organize it based on other applications. So say, you have 90% of the uh, keywords in your resume that's in the job description, you might have a 90% score on your resume or application, or your resume and application might be at the very top of the list. So that way employers see that one first. So since we know this, um, we can kind of work forward to make our resume materials a little bit better. So reading through that job description is really important. Um, look to see what they're looking for. Look for those keywords. Um, for example, in the healthcare industry, um, activities of daily living, that is a phrase that is used a lot in healthcare. And if you have worked as a CNA, or maybe you've worked with a family member to give them care at the end of their life, um, you definitely want to include that keyword in your resume. So we never want to lie. We never want to, you know, just plug keywords in so that way we get past the computers. Um, if we don't have those skills, we definitely want to make sure we have those skills, but we're also trying to figure out the best way to articulate those skills in our application materials. Try not to copy and paste the job description in your resume. Um, something that I've noticed some job seekers have done in the past is they will uh, copy the job description. They'll kind of paste it on the bottom of their resume and then they'll put it in white font because they don't think that people can see that and they think it'll help them get past the applicant tracking system. That used to work back in the day, believe it or not, but now it does not. Now ATS systems can pick that out and they'll actually flag that you did that on your resume and you can be blocked from applying for that job in the future. So again, always just be as honest as you can and try to incorporate um, those relevant keywords in there. Also, something that um, is important is try to stay away from using graphics or pictures in your resume. Sometimes we find these um, really cute templates in Microsoft Word and we want to use them. But sometimes if we have a picture of ourselves or we have um, you know, our initials in the corner as a picture, that can throw the ATS system off and it can actually be detrimental to your resume and it can actually put it in the no pile sometimes. So we want to try to use the simplest resume format as we can. You want to try to stay away from using those pictures or graphics. Um, also, something that I just learned last week, um, you know, the great thing about job searching is that trends change quite a bit. Something I learned last week is that if you're uploading a resume into a employer portal and you think that employer is using an ETS system, you should always upload that resume as a Microsoft Word document. So that's changed a little bit. Um, so before it was you upload a PDF. 
Um, now, if you're uploading it into a employer portal for an application, you want to try to upload it as a Microsoft Word document. However, if you're emailing your resume to a person, you want to make sure it's a PDF. So that's just a little tip for you there. Also, this tip is more for um, people rather than ATS systems. So if you want to kind of help uh, secure that interview as best as possible. Um, something you can kind of include in your cover letter to help you get ahead of everyone else is, you know, include what impresses you about your, that company and why is that company a leader in their industry? Sometimes we forget to tell the employer, hey, this is why I want to work for you. It's because your company is really great and this is why your company is great. So that's just a little something extra you can include in your cover letter. Um, at the very bottom of the screen, I did include a resource. Um, www.jobscan.com. Um, that is a free resource in a sense. Um, what that website does is you can upload your or copy and paste your resume. And then in the next box, you can copy and paste the job description of the job you want to apply for. And then it will tell you, hey, you need to put these keywords in your resume or you're missing these keywords. And that's, um, that's going to be an issue. Um, I think you can do up to three resumes and job descriptions at no cost to you. And then after that, you have to pay. So just be, a mind, just be mindful of that, but that's a really good resource you can use as a job seeker. Um, and just some more job searching tips. So uh, if you are doing some digital job searching, um, you can kind of prepare yourself so that way it kind of goes as smoothly as possible. Um, so for example, sometimes these online job applications will ask us, you know, tell us the last five employers you've had and tell me how much you made at each job, what was your supervisor name, um, and what are the exact dates? So the month, the day, and the year. So sometimes if you write that down, somewhere and you have that right next to you when you're applying for jobs, that's going to save you a lot of time because I know I'm a busy person. And if I'm doing something like that, I definitely don't have time to look through my phone every five minutes, try to find the information, Google stuff, calling people. It's just a little too much. So if you can kind of do a like a sample job application or you just write all that information in a notebook and you have that in a secure place and keep it next to you, um, that will help you do those job applications a lot easier. Also, just make sure you label your application materials appropriately. Um, this is something that I've caught a couple of people doing. Um, when we're talking about labeling application materials, we're talking about the file names for our resumes and cover letters and references and all of that. So just make sure that you're labeling those appropriately. Um, so for example, if I write a cover letter to apply at Northwestern Medicine, and then I'm using that same cover letter to apply to Swedish American, and I forget to change the file name, you know, Swedish American is going to see that, oh, this person must have applied for Northwestern Medicine, and that can kind of um, deter employers for wanting to bring you in for an interview. Um, also, try to stay away from using really complex um, file names for your resume and cover letter. So like resume 32145 um, or something of that nature. The best thing you can do is put your last name in that file name and then put what the document is. So for me, I would put cost period resume or cost period cover letter. Um, and then I would just wanna make sure that I'm uploading the correct materials. And we kind of talked about this already. So making sure that you're recording the name and the contact information of everyone you've talked to. Um, that this can be an Excel document. This can be the same notebook that you're putting that, um, you're recording that information for your job applications in. Um, you can build it into your calendar or if you have um, Google Calendar on your email, you can put that in there. So just always staying organized is so important and it's gonna make you feel a lot less stressed when you are kind of checking back in with employers. And you wanna to try to stick to that five to seven business days. I think I said five to 10 before, but five to seven is um, the preferred time frame, And it's always business days, so not actual days. So if you apply um, for a job on Christmas Eve, you know, Christmas Eve and Christmas day do not count unless um, they just don't count, even if they're on like a Thursday, Friday. So just always be mindful of that. Um, always be mindful of when you're contacting employers. So if you call them right at 8 a.m., 
and you know that they open right at 8 a.m., you know, they might not answer right away because they're trying to open up and they're trying to get things ready. So always be considerate of employer's time. Um, you always want to be as polite as possible when you're following up, even though you're frustrated that you haven't heard anything. Um, you know, just always keep calling back. Just if you don't get an answer, call back after a couple of days, just to be safe again. And someone asked if you're doing a visual resume, should you just bring it to the interview? Um, so if you have a digital, or if you have a virtual interview, so you're interviewing with an employer um, on a screen, uh, sometimes you can have your resume ready and then you can offer to screen share it if you'd like, um, but you always want to uh, make sure that you upload your resume when you apply for that job initially. And you can also offer to email it to the employers afterwards. So maybe when you contact them after the interview with your thank you note, which we're gonna talk about later on in the presentation, you can say, you know, I've also just attached my resume, again, just to reiterate some of the skills that you have. And someone did ask a question about unemployment. I'm so sorry, I can't answer questions about unemployment, but I would highly um, recommend that you reach out to the DeKalb Workforce Development Office um, and they can kind of assist you with identifying the correct phone number to contact unemployment with. Okay, so now we're gonna move into Digital interviewing, this is always a really fun topic in my opinion. Um, like I said, digital interviewing is definitely here to stay. Um, if you haven't had a digital interview yet and you end up having one scheduled in the future, just always make sure that you're preparing yourself. Um, even if you have had a digital interview in the past, it's always good as a job seeker to always be trying to improve yourself as a job seeker, always trying to stay up with the trends. So reading articles online, um, watching YouTube videos. I think TikTok now has a resume portion on there. I haven't checked that out, um, but you know that would still count as you know trying to stay up to date with things. So with digital interviewing, um, the biggest thing that I want everyone to remember. So if you can only remember one or two slides, this is one of them. Preparation equals success. So you always want to be as prepared as possible before the interview starts. Um, even the day before the interview starts. So you always want to practice your greeting and potential interview responses. Um, sometimes Google is your best friend when it comes to job searching. I know that's probably not the most professional tip in the world, but um, you know, if you are interviewing for a job that's really industry specific, you can always Google you know, top interview questions for, for phlebotomists. And sometimes they'll give you some examples. Um, also behavioral questions are really popular in interviews. Um, a behavioral question is a question, for example, um, the employer might ask you, tell me about a time where you disagreed with a coworker or tell me about a time where you were in a stressful situation at work. And with those questions, you really want to explain what the situation is, what was the action, so how did you try to resolve it, and what was the positive outcome. So you always want to try to stay away from sharing negative outcomes in an interview. You know, the interview is really a chance for you to explain to the employer why you would be a great fit, not why you didn't like your last job, you know, not why, you know, you're just taking this job for money. You always want to try to put your best foot forward and you always want to try to help the employer see this person would be a great fit here. Also, researching the company beforehand is so important. So not just um, understanding what they do and what services they provide and what products they offer, but read content that they've posted on LinkedIn and social media. Um, have they been in the news for anything positive? Um, you always wanna bring up positive things in the interview. Uh, go to the company's website, read their About Us section. What has their CEO been up to? Um, do they have any new locations? Have they partnered with anyone in the community? Um, all of those things are so important to learn when you're researching. And also just write down maybe like three things you learned about that company, and then you can have it right next to you during the interview. Also with the preparation, testing your technology is so important when you're doing digital interviewing. 
Um, it's kind of like the equivalent of arriving on time for an interview almost. You wanna make sure that you have everything set up, you have everything ready to go before the interview starts. Now, I know sometimes things are out of our control. For example, um, I was in a meeting one day and we had just this giant storm come through and it just kind of came out of nowhere. And then my internet cut out for a little bit. Um, so it only cut out for about five minutes. So we were able to get back on, but you know, just little things like that are out of our control, but there are some things that we can do to kind of help prepare ourselves. So the biggest thing is making sure your camera and your microphone work. So um, if you haven't used Zoom before or you're not really familiar with Zoom or maybe the interview is on like WebEx and you've never used WebEx, um, maybe jump on with a family member or a friend just to make sure that they work. Practice turning your camera and your microphone on and off. Um, every once in a while, we accidentally bump a button or a key and then that will tend to turn our microphone off when we're not expecting it. So always know how to turn those back on. Um, just check to make sure that if your computer needs an update, if you have to download the software ahead of time, that's why practicing ahead of time is important. Um, I know that happened to me once where I didn't realize Zoom had an update and then I was about five minutes late to a meeting. Um, so if that was an interview, you know, that would probably be a bad first impression, but we always want to make sure that we do that stuff ahead of time. Also with Wi-Fi speed, um, I know this is uh, tend to be a hot topic with individuals who have children at home, um, especially teenagers who like to play video games um, on the Xbox and PlayStation and PC and things. So, you know, if you know you have an interview coming up and you know there's gonna be other people in the house, you know, just communicate that with everyone. Just say, hey, you know, from nine to 10 a.m., everyone has to be off the video games. Everyone has to be um, off the Zoom. Um, just so I can do this interview. And maybe if you need to come up with another activity activity for them to do, that would be good too. Um, also charge your device. Um, so, you know, if you have a digital interview and you're doing it on your laptop, just make sure your laptop is plugged in for the whole time so you don't have to worry about that. Make sure it's by an outlet that works. Um, I know sometimes we have outlets that tend to not work or maybe you have to flip a light switch for them to work again. So just always be aware of that. Preparing your space, this is also something that's so important for digital interviewing um, because the employer, it's, the employer only sees what's on the screen. So you kind of have to control that as much as possible. Um, so definitely finding an area where you will not be distracted. So for example, if you usually have meetings um, in your dining room and there's a bunch of dirty dishes on the table, even though the employer can't see it, you'll be able to see it and that might distract you a little bit. So go ahead and clean out your, um, your interview space, make sure it's good to go, free of distractions. Um, if you need to kind of set up like your own little interview space just for that interview, you can do that. Um, I actually had a job seeker do that one time where she had an interview coming up. She said she never had a digital interview before in her life. Um, so she actually went into her daughter's room, you know, kind of staged it in her daughter's room. And then her daughter was just in the living room playing um, and then she just kind of tore it down after the interview. So that was kind of fun for her. She was able just to kind of create her own little space. Um, she had a really nice background. Um, so you can definitely do that. Just kind of create a temporary interview area if you need to. Um, also make sure you use a background that's clean and clear. So you should try to make sure that your head and shoulders take up most of the screen, kind of like how I am right now. Um, if you are way too far away from the camera, kind of what you're telling the employer is, hey, look at everything else but me. Um, you know, if you're extra tiny on the screen, they probably won't be able to see you as well. And then that's when they can kind of look around at other things on your screen. Um, you want to try to stay away from having anything really distracting in the background. So um, like piles of clothes, if you have a bed in the background, make sure that it's made and everything is cleared off of it. Um, if you have any pets or any other people in your home, try to make sure that they're not walking around in the background. Um, I know sometimes that can be hard if we have a smaller space to live in, but just do the best that you can. Um, also, this is another really good tip. Make sure your laptop or computer is on a desk or table. Um, if you are using a cell phone, try to find a tripod if you have one laying around so that way it can be propped up um, or make sure you're holding it at eye level. 
Sometimes it can be a little, it can look a little weird when you have your laptop on your lap and you're kind of looking down at the camera. That's not as flattering in my opinion. Um, so the best thing you can do is having it on a table and then that way it won't shake as much. I know if I'm an employer and the camera is kind of shaking around, it's gonna be really hard for me to focus on you and what you can offer me. And also just make sure that you have notes available if needed. So we kind of talked about writing down um, those facts that we learned about the company when we do our research. So having those available, um, definitely having questions down that we wanna ask the employer at the end of the interview. Um, and also just any maybe little bullet points that we have. So if you definitely wanna tell the employer, hey, this is the time on where I worked really well with a customer who was angry at me. And if they don't ask that question, you can bring that up. You can say, by the way, I just wanna let you know that I'm really good at customer service. And here's just a brief example of a time where I handled that correctly. Does anyone have any questions about interviewing so far? I'll kind of give you a little bit of time to type those into the Q&A if you need to. We still have a little bit more info to talk about interviewing. I just wanted to pause for a minute. So someone asked a really good question. So why do interviews seem to go really well, but they never hire me? So sometimes that happens and it can be really frustrating. You have an interview, sometimes it goes really, really well. You think I for sure got that job. Um, and then they just don't offer it to you. So sometimes that does happen. And I wish I just had one answer to explain why that happens, but I don't um, because it can be a few different factors. Maybe there was someone else they interviewed who they just uh, thought would be a better fit for the company. Um, and in your interviews, if you've noticed that they're going really well, but you're not hired, maybe switch up some of the questions you're asking employers. So maybe at the end of the interview, you can ask, do you have any concerns on how my qualifications fit this position? Okay. That's just kind of a really gentle way of asking, you know, is there anything that, that I might not be a good fit for? Um, and if you ask that question, sometimes employers might say, well, you know, we really want someone with five years of customer service experience and you have four, then that's when you can say, actually, I only have four on my resume, but I worked two additional years at this company, but it's not on my resume. So that can kind of be an end where you're kind of explaining. Um, another really good question you can ask an employer is, um, so maybe like six, six months from now, when you look back what are some of the best qualities you see someone having in this role to be successful, okay? And if they say, you know, we really want someone with good time management experience and we want someone who can connect with our customers, then you can bring in examples on how you'd be a good fit in those capacities. Every once in a while for interviews, um, employers tend to stick to a script. So a list of questions that they have prepared for themselves or human resources has prepared for them. And sometimes they forget to ask the really important questions. So by asking those thoughtful questions at the end, that will kind of get the conversation going a little bit more. So someone also mentioned um, they, were, they heard that having notes in an interview in person is a bad thing. Um, so you can definitely have notes in an interview. That is a good thing. Taking notes in an interview is a good thing. Um, maybe at the beginning you can say, you know, is it okay if I just write down some notes? Um, and you can just reiterate that you're just really interested in the position. You don't want to forget anything. Um, but you have to be kind of mindful with how you're using your notes. If you're staring at them the whole time, that can be a distraction. Um, and especially in a digital interview, if you're constantly looking down and you're not looking at the camera or the screen, the employer might think that you're not interested or that you're distracted, but really you're just looking at your notes. Um, so at the end, if you're asking those questions, you can say, I just have a few questions, but let me just refer to my notes just for a minute. Then that way they know that you're looking at those. So it's all about how you use them. Um, another thing that people have done in the past, and maybe you can do this if you have a video interview, is sometimes they'll write this, their notes on little sticky notes, and then they'll stick it on their laptop. So I can't show you right now because um, this camera is facing at me, but what they'll do is they'll write them on sticky notes and they'll stick them just right around their screen. So when they look at their notes, it looks like they're looking into the camera, but they're not. 
That's just kind of a little hack that you can do where you still have that information in front of you, but it's an organized fashion. So if you want to do something fun and color code them, um, maybe the questions can be on pink post-it notes and the things you want to tell employers can be on yellow post-it notes. That'll help you organize that a little bit more. Okay, we'll just kind of move on. If you have any additional questions about interviewing, just post those in the Q&A and then I'll get to them in a little bit. So after you've completely prepared yourself for the interview, now you have to actually start the interview and you have to make that really good first impression off the bat. Um, first impressions in a digital interview is almost the same thing as first impressions in an in-person interview except you can't you know, shake their hands. They can't see how excited you are. They can just see your face. Um, so you have to really nail that first five minutes of that interview. So be as professional as you can. Um, always dress professionally. Always wear clothes during a digital interview. Even if you are interviewing in your own home, you still wanna be dressed. You still wanna be dressed professionally, okay? Um, you can do what they call the zoom mullet where you're wearing a professional shirt and your hair is done and your makeup's done and things but maybe you're wearing a pair of sweatpants that's totally fine to do just be mindful of that um you know if you have to get up to get like a pencil or something that they don't see that so always just make sure you have everything around you um you always want to start the conversation with a friendly greeting so if anyone has ever been in a zoom call you kind of know that the first couple minutes might be awkward while you're waiting for everyone to get on. Um, so instead of sitting there and staring at everyone, you know, be that extrovert and say, you know, how's everyone's day going? You know, how was your weekend? Um, you know, I'm so excited to be here today. Or I saw on the news that you guys are opening a new facility. That must be really exciting. Um, you know, try to get that conversation going right away. It doesn't have to be um, those formal interview questions, but it should still be professional conversation. Always smile and be engaged in the conversation. So I know sometimes when we are, are really nervous for an interview, um, it can be easy to not smile. And sometimes that just means we're nervous, but the employer doesn't know that. Um, what we think in our minds and what we portray you know, on our faces are two different things sometimes. So always be engaged in the conversation. You wanna show that you're active listening. So nodding, raising your eyebrows, you know, verbal affirmations. Yes, I understand. Um, things of that nature. Sometimes if we have to turn our camera off, um, just only doing that for just a couple of minutes, you can say, I'm so sorry, I just need a drink of water or something and just turning your camera off and then turning them back on. Also be mindful of body language. If you tend to talk with your hands a lot and you like to wear bracelets, just make sure you're not wearing really loud bracelets because sometimes when we're talking with our hands on a Zoom call, you know, our microphone can pick that up and it can block what we're saying. So always just be mindful of that. Um, also, we never want to be, um, you know, laying in bed or walking around our apartment when we're doing a Zoom interview. So always trying to be stationary and having our laptop on a table is the best thing you can do. Um, at the beginning of the interview, you might want to ask if they can hear you okay. Um, every once in a while when we have an older computer, there's a setting where we can turn our microphone, um, you know, higher or lower. And if it's on the very low end, or the employer might not be able to hear you. So that kind of goes back to just testing your technology and making sure that they can hear you okay. Um, looking into the camera lens. So sometimes when we look into the camera lens, it gives the illusion that we are making eye contact. So that's the best thing we can do right now when we're doing these digital interviews. Um, the same thing goes for if you are doing a digital interview, but it's recorded. I don't know if anyone has had experience with that, but what that would look like is um, instead of talking to a person on a Zoom call or a WebEx call, you would have these questions pop up on the screen and then you would answer them while the computer's recording you. And then that recording is sent to the employer to watch later on. So even though you're not actually talking to a person, you still need to be looking into the camera lens um, pretending that you're talking to a person. So I think someone told me once that they took a really big picture of their grandma and they put it actually behind their laptop. And then they just looked at their grandma and they pretended like they were talking to their grandma the whole time. Um, so that kind of helped them ease their nerves a little bit. And then it kind of helped them a little bit more with um, talking about their skills. 
Um, please do not chew gum or eat food while you're doing a digital interview. Um, I know sometimes our schedules can be a little hectic and sometimes we need to do an interview during lunch or um, you know, maybe we're nervous and we think that chewing gum can help, but the microphone will pick that up. <laughs> you know, they'll, they will, it will pick up chewing. Um, you know, you can definitely have a glass of water or, you know, a cup of coffee next to you, but just be mindful with how you're drinking that. And these are some more advanced ways where you can make a really good first impression. Um, so these are not required, but these are just ways where you can kind of go the extra mile for making that really good first impression. So we talked about beginning the conversation early, asking the employer a thoughtful question right off the bat. Um, so maybe when they ask, say, hey, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? You know, you talk about your skills, um, you know, where you've worked in the past, what you want to do. And at the very end, you can say, um, you know, my career goal is to eventually work in a management position in healthcare. Um, how long have you been in your management role? You know, kind of asking them that question. So I know sometimes people will say that in successful interviews, you always want to turn the interview around on the employer, but sometimes that's not always appropriate. So asking them a couple of questions during the interview is okay, but you never want to avoid answering questions. So if they say, tell me a little bit about your experience and you say, well, why don't you tell me a little bit more about your experience? You know, that could be a no-no and, you know, you might not be able to get the job. So always making sure that you're being as honest as possible, giving those thoughtful answers, but, you know, throw a couple of questions in there for the employer. Um, if the employer mentions that you're going to be doing something, um, you know, and it really sounds interesting to you, make sure you verbalize that. Again, I think when we tend to get really nervous, we forget to mention what we're passionate about. Um, so if they say, you know, really, I know in the job description, it says you're going to be doing this, but actually 80% of the time, you're going to be interacting with patients one-on-one. -on -one. You can say, that is great. That really excites me. Um, I did not know that about the position, but now after hearing it, I know for a fact that I would be very interested in working in this role. We kind of talked about notes already, so try to stay away from staring down at your notes. Um, always try to express positive emotions. So sometimes this is where, um, you know, another person's opinion can come in handy when you're preparing for that interview. So when you're talking about um, your previous experiences. So for example, if you had a job in the past that you weren't really a fan of, maybe you weren't a good fit, maybe you didn't gel well with the manager there. Um, that's okay, those things happen, but when you're explaining that in an interview, you never wanna say, well, that person never gave me a chance. They had it out for me for on day one. Um, that's not very positive. You wanna to try to be as positive as possible. Um, it kind of goes back to that age old saying, you know, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Um, if they do ask you about your previous manager and you didn't get along with them, you can say, you know what, that manager had a different style of doing things um, and we accomplish our objectives together. Um, but, you know, I'm moving on because I'm looking for a more inclusive environment. So just kind of keeping it really short and sweet. Also let your personality shine through. I know sometimes that can be hard um, when we tend to be more introverted in nature and we go to these digital interviews and we have to really be bubbly and, person and personable, it can be hard. But that's something you can practice either in a mirror or with a family member. Um, also in an interview, I know sometimes when we the interview is not going well, we wanna to try to get out of there as fast as possible. But the interview might actually be going really well. You just might not realize it um, because you're stressed. So always try to connect with your interviewers, not just sit there and be like, you know, in 2007, I worked here. And then I, in 2008, I worked here. Like actually try to be engaged in that conversation, um, you know, showcase that active listening. If you are not sure what a question is asking for, you can ask that, that's okay. You can say, oh, would you like to know about this or this, or can you re um, repeat that question for me? And that's totally fine to do because sometimes the employer's internet might be, not be working. Maybe they get cut out for a little bit. It's okay to say, I'm so sorry, you cut out just for a minute. Can you repeat that? Um, sometimes it's okay to share small pieces of personal information about yourself when appropriate. Um, so you have to be really careful about this. There are some things that interviewers are not allowed to ask you um, in an interview setting, such as um, marital status, familial size, um, religion, sexual orientation, things like that. 
Um, but you know, if you guys are talking um, about a interview question and you kind of say, well, I gained these skills um, because I played this sport in high school and they might ask you a little bit more information about that. And that's okay just to give them a little bit more, but you wanna to try to steer the conversation back to what you can offer. Another really good tip is try to remember your interviewers' names and use them throughout the interview. So the great thing about Zoom is that usually that person's name is right next to their little picture. So if they ask you a question, you can say, you know, that's a really great point, Bob. Um, you know, let me talk a little bit more about that. Or when you're paraphrasing at the end, you can say, you know, Sally mentioned that I would be doing this. I just want to hear a little bit more information about that. That kind of shows that you're taking the time to remember their names. If you need to write that down on a piece of paper, you can do that too. So I know that um, there are a lot of interview questions out there. And today I will not be able to go over how to answer every single interview question, you know, that's out there, but I can kind of give you some advice on how to answer interview questions. That way you can kind of formulate your own responses. Um, you will always want to provide thoughtful, concise answers. You never want to just say yes, no, or I don't know. Um, so for example, if someone asks you, do you have any experience using QuickBooks? Instead of just saying, no, I don't, you can say, you know what, I don't have any experience using QuickBooks specifically, but I do have a lot of experience tracking financial information with Excel. And I know that for a fact that I would be able to learn QuickBooks in a quick, timely manner, or, you know, I'm signed up for a class to take QuickBooks. So kind of turn that back around. Um, usually the appropriate answer length for interview questions should be about 60 to 90 seconds. Um, it can be a little bit longer if it's a more complex question or a complex answer. But, um, you know, for example, if the employer says, tell me about yourself, and then you talk for 15 to 20 minutes, you're kind of giving them all of that information up front, and that can be very overwhelming for an employer. So sometimes it's good just to kind of keep those answers short because you never know what those questions are going to be. Maybe they're going to ask you that question a little bit later on, and then you're kind of in a situation where you have to repeat yourself. So this is something else that practicing can really help you. So um, what you can do is you can kind of answer really basic interview questions and then just time yourself on your phone. You'd be really surprised with how long or how short your answers are. Um, it kind of goes back to that um, concept where they say time is relevant or relative. That is very true. Whenever we're really stressed or we're in a situation that we don't really want to be in, time tends to take forever but it really it's only been about 30 seconds to a minute. Um, and we kind of mentioned this before, but when you're answering behavioral questions, always list the situation, the action, the outcome. Um, so for example, if they say, tell me of a time where you worked with a very difficult customer, a good example of that would be, you know, we had a customer come in who was very angry, we weren't sure why they were angry and they were calling one of our coworkers a very um, inappropriate name. So I stepped in, I told the customer that that was not acceptable, that she would need to stop or she would need to leave. Um, and the customer did not stop. So I asked her to leave um, to make that uh, space more safe for all of the coworkers. So you can kind of walk me through step-by-step step for that employer to see. So someone did ask a really great question in the chat box. So um, are interviewers allowed to ask if I need special accommodations, if they notice um, I wear hearing aids or is that illegal to ask? That is a really good question. Um, I am not versed in employment law, so I can't give you a really specific answer. Um, but you should know before you go into the job whether or not you need special accommodations sometimes. If you don't, then that's okay to ask tell the employer, no, I do not need a special accommodations. Um, it is not against the law for an employer to ask if you need any accommodations to complete the job, but they shouldn't, I don't think they should call you out on you know, your appearance. Um, so just try to be comfortable with answering that question um, as much as possible. So if an employer says, do you need special accommodations? What you don't wanna do is say, that's illegal, you can't ask me that, okay? Because that can come off as a little abrasive. Um, so maybe just saying, you know, no, I do not need any accommodations. Thank you for asking. Or you can say right now I'm really focusing on if I would 
be interested in the position, if I would be a really good fit, but I'd be more than welcome to talk about accommodations when I'm offered the position. So that's a couple of different ways you can answer that. Anyone else have any questions about questions they were stumped on during the interview? Maybe you're asked a question, you're like, oh, I'm not sure how to answer that. I don't see any more, but I'll keep an eye out. So if you're still typing those in, keep going. And then it, once you post them, I'll answer those for you. So always make sure that you're detailing your achievements as well in an interview setting. So um, you want to really focus on what you've achieved. How do you, how do you stand out among your peers? So how do you stand out from those other job seekers? Because in a competitive job market, you might be interviewing alongside, you know, five to 10 other people. So it's just really important to talk about how you would be a really good fit for that position. Um, maybe you saved your company money in a previous job. Maybe you solved a really complex problem. Um, maybe you were in a situation that was a little uncomfortable in terms of dealing with a difficult customer. That's when you can talk about that. And what made you really good at that job? So not just rehashing your resume saying, well, you know, I was a cashier, so I took money and I restocked the store. Um, but maybe you can say, you know, my supervisor really liked me as an employee because I built a really good rapport with customers and that resulted in customers coming back to our store specifically and spending money. Um, so I was, you know, I was involved with helping with the success of our store by, you know, my great customer service. We do have a couple in the chat, so I'm just going to answer those right now. So tell me of a time when you didn't agree with a policy in your job. That's a really hard one, you know, because again, you don't want to talk about anything negative with your employer, um, but you still need to answer that question. So you can talk about a time where maybe um, your manager brought to you a new initiative on the job, or maybe, um, you know, you had to sell like new products. So you had to kind of change the ways you did things. Um, you can kind of say, well, first, you know, I tried it out. Um, to see if it would work because I wasn't sure if it was going to. And then I noticed that it didn't work for me because, you know, maybe the manager didn't understand your job all the way through. Um, and then talk about how, what you did about it. So maybe you went to your manager and you said, you know, I really tried this way of doing things and it's really not working for me. Um, can we do it this way? So making that suggestion on how you can alter that a little bit in a professional way and what was that outcome? Sometimes the outcome is, you know, the manager still said no and you still had to do things, you know, that policy way. And it's okay to say that. You can say, you know, my manager turned down my proposal, uh, but I was still able to be a professional about it and I still carried out that policy. Um, how did you manage your most stressful situation in past jobs? Um, so if you had a really stressful situation, you can kind of talk about how you as a person analyze those. Um, so this is something you definitely want to have prepared, um, you know, for future interviews. Um, so you can say, you know, whenever I'm in a stressful situation, I need to tell myself to take a deep breath, you know, unclench my jaw, um, analyze the situation, what needs to be dealt with first, um, you know, addressing that immediately. Um, you know, if it's a safety concern, you know, addressing that as soon as possible. Um, but if it's something where I feel uncomfortable with a customer, and there's another coworker nearby going to that coworker and saying, hey, you know, I'm going to be working with this customer. This is what I've noticed with this customer. And can you just keep an eye out um, to kind of see how it goes? That way you're kind of bringing your team member in, but you're not saying, hey, can you do this for me? Because I don't want to type of thing. I hope that answered your question. And again, you can always Google things. Google is your best resource and you can come into the DeKalb Workforce Development Office and ask them for interview prep. And since I work in career services, if you are a alumni of Kishwaukee College or you are a student, you can always come to me as well. Um, this kind of goes more into detailing your achievements. So um, keeping it concise and brief, always be honest. That's a really important one as well. And you always want to really show that you want the job. So asking those thoughtful questions at the end of the interview, 
Um, what professional development opportunities do you offer your staff? What do you enjoy most about working here? I love asking employers that question um, because sometimes employers forget why they like their job. And that is kind of a good way to ask about the benefits about working there. You never want to talk, ask questions like, you know, what's your health insurance plan? What's your retirement plan? You have days off. Um, in that initial interview, you try to, you want to try to not ask those questions. So when you ask, what do you enjoy most about working here? That kind of gives the end to the employer to talk about those things. So they might say, you know, in the summer, we work a shortened schedule and it doesn't dock or pay at all. And they might say, wow, that's great. Um, you know, of course, that's not a question you can ask in that first interview, but you're giving that employer the end to talk about some of the benefits about working for that company. And again, you always want to follow up. So, um, you know, after an interview setting, digital or in person, you always want to follow up within 24 hours of the interview. Okay. That's really important time frame. If you have an interview at 8 a.m. on like Monday, you want to make sure you follow up with them before the end of the business day usually. Okay. Um, and that follow-up can be a few different ways. And it really depends on the employer and the interview. Um, if it was a very formal interview on Zoom, you might want to um, write a really nice email to the people you interviewed with and send it to them in an email or write a nice formal letter as a Microsoft Word document and then attach it to that email. <clears throat> Excuse me. If it was a very um, informal interview, so maybe you just went to a job fair and you talked to an employer at that job fair, um, maybe it was a digital job fair as well, and the employer gives you your contact information, maybe giving them a call that next day and saying, hey, this is Amanda. I talked with you at the job fair yesterday. I just wanna thank you again so much for taking the time to talk to me about this position. I just want to know what I can do now to apply for the position and to get my foot in the door. And they might say, you know, you definitely need to do the online application first and then send me your resume. And if they say that, make sure you follow those steps exactly. And again, you want to always thank the employer for their time and reiterate your interest in the position. Um, someone asked earlier if you should give the employer your resume. Um, if you're sending a thank you email, you can definitely attach your resume again and say, hey, you know, this is, I'm just kind of attaching my resume again, just so you can take another look. Or if you talk to that employer in the interview and they asked you about work experience that wasn't on your resume, this is when it's okay to send them a longer resume. So usually we wanna to stick to one page resume if we can, but we, if we have a two to three page resume, you can send that to them after the interview so they can read a little bit more about you, that's fine. Okay, so before we move into LinkedIn, I'm just going to see if we have any additional questions. So someone asked if you, um, what, what do you do if you have the interviewer's last day, but you don't have any co contact information for them? So this is a question that you should definitely ask in the interview. You should ask, you know, What's a good way to follow up with you? Um, is it okay if I send you an email to follow up or is a phone call better for you? And then that's when you can take down their information. Every once in a while, you might get a call from an employer and it's kind of like a screening call, like an initial interview where they just ask you a couple of questions and then they schedule that interview with you. And sometimes you never hear back from them. You're thinking, well, you know, I talked to this person for 15 minutes on the phone and they said they would schedule an interview with me and then I never heard back, like what's going on. Just always make sure that you have a pen and pa piece of paper next to you when you're talking to them and ask, you know, what's your, what's your first and last name? And is okay if I have a phone number for you just in case I have questions about that position. Um, if it's after the interview and you forget to ask that, which sometimes people do and that's okay, um, you can always call that corporate number. You can say, hey, I'm so sorry. I actually talked to a recruiter from your company this was their first name. I was just wondering if you had a contact number for them so I can connect. Um, sometimes they're more than willing to help you with that. If they don't have that contact information, you can just ask to speak to their human resource department or um, whoever is recruiting for your region. And then someone asked, why did you quit your last job? Um, so you always want to focus on your future career goals and the positive things. So if you had to leave your job because it was a hostile work environment, 
Um, you want to be kind of careful with how you're wording that. So you never want to say, well, my boss was a jerk, so I left. <laughs> because then the employer, the employer who doesn't know you is going to think, okay, was it really the boss or was it this person who didn't get along with the boss? Um, so just try to keep it as concise as possible. You can say, you know what, my previous job, I liked it because of this, but it actually wasn't a very inclusive environment for me. Um, I did not feel safe working there. So I am looking for a more inclusive environment and I want a career change, or you can talk about your career goals. You can say, well, you know what, I moved or um, I started school and I'm just looking for something that works with my schedule. Sometimes coming up with another excuse is okay in those situations. But again, always trying to be as professional as you can. Okay, I don't think I see any other questions. So we're gonna jump into LinkedIn. So if you are a job seeker and you are doing most of your job search online, which I think 90% of job searching is online now, um, and you have work experience or you've been to school, LinkedIn it would be a really great tool for you to use. Um, LinkedIn is kind of like a social media for job seekers um, in that you can connect with people that you know um, and you can kind of follow them so you can look to see what they post and things. But it's a little bit different from other social medias. So for example, instead of using LinkedIn as like Instagram or Pinterest um, or, you know, Snapchat where you're saying, hey, you know, here's a donut recipe. I like donuts. Here's a picture of a donut I ate this morning. Um, you're trying to be a little bit more professional about it. So you're saying, you know, I have three years of experience making donuts. My top skills are donut production or I want to work for a donut company. Okay. So that's just kind of an example of um, how LinkedIn is used a little bit differently as a social media platform. Um, you always want to try to stay away from uh, posting really opinionated things on LinkedIn. So again, really as professional as possible. And you usually want to try to stick to whatever your industry is in. So if you have opinion, if you work in healthcare and you have an opinion about um, a new healthcare initiative that's coming out, definitely you can post that and talk about it. Um, you can also like other people's job status updates. You can put on your LinkedIn profile that you're looking for work. Um, you can turn it on your LinkedIn profile so that recruiters can see that you're looking and then you know that can kind of help you get a job a little bit easier. Um, LinkedIn also has a job board. So you can actually apply for jobs through the LinkedIn jobs um, tab at the top. And they also have a LinkedIn app as well on your phone. So you definitely want to try to take a really good LinkedIn photo. Um, LinkedIn pictures do help you get more views from potential employers and recruiters. It kind of adds validity to your profile. So, you know, if they see that there's five Amanda Costs and there's only one Amanda Costs that has a picture, they're going to assume it's that person, okay? So if you have a really common name or, um, you know, you live in an area where there's a lot of other people, definitely try to put a profile picture up. Um, I kind of offered my profile picture up. I know it's not the greatest, but you always want to make sure that your head and your shoulders take up most of the picture and that you have a pretty plain background. So you never want to uh, use a picture where you're taking a picture with someone else and then kind of crop them out because you tend to be leaning to one side. Um, you also want to try to stay away from using anything that's not professional. So if you were, um, you know, like at a party or at a concert, someone took a picture of you, you're probably not wearing a professional attire. So, you know, make this fun for you. Have a little LinkedIn photo shoot. Maybe you know someone who's pretty good at taking pictures on phones or cameras. Um, and then you can, you know, get all dressed up, have a nice little backdrop. Um, you can actually go outside and take LinkedIn photos as well. I know sometimes people will have... Um, like a brick background or maybe just a tree in their background, you can definitely do that. Natural lighting is usually the best. Um, and I think usually on the new iPhones, they have an option where you can blur your background as well. I don't have a new iPhone, so I can't tell you how to do that. But um, those are just some tips on taking a good profile picture. Um, you always want to make sure that you're updating everything on your LinkedIn profile. So you definitely want to add your headline your location and industry, your summary, your work experience, and your educational skills. The really good thing about a headline, I'm just gonna go back a couple of slides just so you can see. So um, what's really important about your headline on LinkedIn is that your headline is always next to your name when someone is searching for you. 
So you can kind of see below my name, I have that little blurb right there. Um, whenever someone is searching for my name or they see me in a list of contacts, they're always gonna see that headline. So it's really important to put a headline in there that's gonna grab an employer's attention and it's gonna help you stand out from everyone else. I do have a couple of examples on this slide kind of towards the bottom. So you wanna kind of describe um, yourself as a professional and you wanna kind of include industry specific things in there. So if you're still a student in school, talk about what um, entry level position you wanna work in. Are you looking for an internship? That would be a really good place to put that. Um, if you work in the healthcare field. So for example, if you're a radiology student and you have a little bit of healthcare experience, you can use dedicated healthcare professional, radiology student graduating May, 2021. That way, if I'm a hospital and I'm trying to find entry level, you know, people to work in my radiology positions, I'll see that right away and I'll know that you're looking for work. So once you find a job, you wanna make sure you go back and change that. But those are just um, some different examples on what you can put in your headline on LinkedIn. There are some really big differences between your LinkedIn profile and your resume. Um, the good thing about LinkedIn is that you can talk about your skills and experiences kind of in first person. So on your resume, you probably have something along the lines of, um, you know, like service 500 customers within the first six months or obtained um, a contract of $50,000. Um, that's pretty clear cut technical writing in a LinkedIn profile on your, um, on your work experience, you can kind of be a little bit more personable with that. So you can say something I really enjoyed about working here is how I made really good connections with my clients. Um, those are the kind of things you can put in your LinkedIn profile. Something that sometimes people will do is that they will copy and paste um, things off of their resume into LinkedIn, and then they'll just kind of rewrite it a little bit. So on your resume, you're not supposed to use first person language like I, me, or my, but in LinkedIn, you can do that. That's okay. You want to make sure that you're gearing your LinkedIn profile to all potential employers you want to work for. Um, I know, for example, if you are a human resources professional, um, you can work in a lot of different industries as a human resources professional. So if you're looking for that type of job, um, making sure that you're opening up your LinkedIn profile so that it includes human resources terminology, but not to a specific industry, if that makes sense, unless you'd want to work only in manufacturing or healthcare or something like that. Um, you can go more into detail with skills, projects, and interests. There's actually a section on LinkedIn where you can include different skills you have, um, endorsements. So, um, you know, other network people can endorse you for certain skills, so previous coworkers, employers, um, there's also another thing on LinkedIn that you can do now where people can write you letters of recommendation that shows up right on your LinkedIn profile. That's actually something pretty cool and you can actually request it from people that you have connected on LinkedIn. So just like references, how you would never put a reference down before calling them, it kind of goes to the same thing with this um, letter of recommendation section on LinkedIn. So, um, you know, if you had a previous supervisor that you haven't talked to in five years, maybe sending them an email or a message on LinkedIn first saying, hey, you know, this is Amanda, you supervised me in this role. I was just wondering if you had time to write me a, um, a letter of recommendation for my LinkedIn profile. And if they say yes, then you can send them that invitation. Um, also include on your LinkedIn profile how... Um, what people can connect with you for. So for example, if you are a real estate professional and you're okay with talking with people about the real estate market, um, on your LinkedIn profile, you can say, connect with me to learn more about the real estate market in DeKalb, Illinois. Um, and then that will get you a lot more hits. A lot more people will see your profile um, and then you can kind of make more connections that way. Again, you can search and apply for jobs on LinkedIn. Um, something that is really beneficial if you have a full LinkedIn profile. So if you took a lot of time to, um, to add things to your LinkedIn, like work experiences, where you went to school, you kind of built up your network a little bit. Um, applying for jobs is gonna be a lot easier um, because I think LinkedIn also has a um, option where you can quick apply with your LinkedIn profile. And then all you have to do is upload your resume. Um, you can also see who in your network is working for that company. 
So say, um, for example, I'm going to use radiology students again. So say you're a radiology student at Kishwaukee College. Um, you've added all of your classmates to your LinkedIn profile. It's been a couple of years since you graduated and now you're looking for a job change. Maybe you've been working for a couple of years and you look on Northwestern Medicine on LinkedIn and you say, oh, Sally actually works at Northwestern Medicine right now. I'm connected with her on LinkedIn and she was a classmate of mine. Then it's okay to reach out to Sally to say, hey, Sally, I took a class with you at Kishwaukee College. I see that you're working at Northwestern Medicine right now. Um, I'm about to apply for this job. I'm just wondering if you have any advice for getting my foot in the door. That is a great way to use your connections to help you get a job, okay? Um, another cool thing about the job module on LinkedIn is you can search for more than one city at a time. So say, for example, um, you're interested in staying where you are, but you're also interested in seeing like what jobs are in downtown Chicago. You can actually set it up so that way you're looking in DeKalb, Illinois and downtown Chicago, um, and you're looking in both of those cities at once. So that's something pretty cool that Indeed or Monster does not have. Um, after you kind of build up your LinkedIn profile and after you've applied for some jobs, um, LinkedIn does have this AI bot that will kind of predict what jobs you'd be interested in. Um, and then when you click on that jobs tab at the top, it's actually going to show you a list of jobs that you might be interested in based on your profile. And then that's kind of a faster way to kind of look for positions that you might be interested in. So someone rec asked, um, do you also recommend using national recruiting agencies? So um, I can't give you a list of recruiting agencies you can use off the top of my head because it really depends on the profession that you're in. Um, I would recommend definitely setting up your LinkedIn profile because sometimes recruiters will use LinkedIn, um, kind of those headhunters, if you will, who are working for companies to find people. Um, you can also hire someone to help you find a job and pay them money to do that, but that can get very expensive. So if you are a job seeker with limited resources, I would definitely stick to LinkedIn, the free version, and then recruiters can find you as long as you're using those correct keywords in there. Um, also, if you kind of think back to that job searching strategy that we talked about, so maybe you wrote on a post-it note, stuck on your fridge, that your top five dream companies that you would love to work for. This is kind of where you can use that. So definitely follow those companies on LinkedIn, interact with their page on a regular basis. So if they post something, um, make sure you like it or comment on it. Always professional things, of course. Um, that way you can kind of stay up to date on what they're doing. So if you have an interview, you can say, yeah, I actually commented on a post you guys had a week ago about how you have been increasing student engagement. I would love to learn more about that strategy. That shows that you are genuinely interested because you've been researching that company. And also, you know, LinkedIn has a lot of tools, but there are some things that you can use LinkedIn for to make the most um, during the pandemic, which hopefully is nearing the end. But, um, but this also, comes into effect just in our day-to-day -day lives. So even if we're not in a pandemic, how do we use the most out of LinkedIn? LinkedIn has all these features. It takes a lot of time to use sometimes. What are five things that I can do now to make sure I are, are, I'm using the full potential of the free LinkedIn version? There is also LinkedIn premium that you can pay for. And I think when you pay for that, you can also have access to, um, to like these short web videos about interviewing on there. And you can also see who has been looking at your profile. So definitely networking is a huge thing about LinkedIn. So um, I think I read an article a while ago that said that to be um, a successful job searcher or to find a job successfully, you need to have at least 500 connections on your LinkedIn. Um, that can be a lot. So maybe if you live in Malta, Illinois, which is a very, very small town, um, maybe at least having 200 will help you if you're planning on staying around the area. Um, if you're in Chicago, it probably would be that 500, if not more. So definitely look through your network. Um, I think at the top of LinkedIn, they have a network tab you can click on. And then once you have your LinkedIn profile built up, LinkedIn will actually suggest people to you. So they'll say, hey, I saw that you went to 
Northern Illinois during this time. Here's some other people who went to Northern Illinois during that time period. And that'll kind of help you find people. Um, you always want to add coworkers that you've had in the past. Um, if you're still in school or you were in school, classmates that you went to school with um, for your degree or major. Um, you can also add people that you've worked with in a professional capacity. Um, maybe you volunteered at a um, domestic violence shelter and you volunteered with someone else who works in a different industry as you. You can definitely still add them on LinkedIn. Um, sometimes LinkedIn will also show you who's a third um, connection. So third connection means you don't have anything in common with them. Um, second degree connection means that you have, um, you guys know the same person. So maybe you both are connected with Sally, um, but you're not connected with each other. Um, and then you have the first degree connection, which are people that you're connected directly with. Um, direct message existing contacts. You do not have to message all of your contacts on a daily basis. That's just way too much work. But again, you know, if you see someone is working in the healthcare industry already and you are trying to get your foot in the door, um, send them a message saying, hey, I see you work at Northwestern Medicine. I was just wondering if you had like five to 10 minutes to meet to talk about, you know, how you got your foot in the door, because I would love to work there. Again, that's just another example. Um, something else you can do is if you are um, connected with someone maybe like an old professor or some or an old supervisor, you can also connect with them to ask them to be a reference for you. And you can say, you know, I'm just wondering if you know anyone who's hiring right now. I'm having a heck of a time looking on these job boards. And they might say, yeah, actually we're hiring at our company right now if you wanna come back. Or, you know, they might give you some suggestions that way. Um, I know I did read an article before um, and they suggested also sending up morning coffees. So if you're a morning person, and you want to connect with someone in the morning, you can say, hey, do you have like five to 10 minutes before you start work? Just to kind of talk about um, my career goals and how it can be a good fit. With LinkedIn, you definitely want to log in at least once per week to add new connections, to view activity, to post things. Um, so if you log in once per week, that's good. Um, with LinkedIn, if you know you're going to set it up and then not look at it for six months, maybe it's best to wait to set up a LinkedIn profile until you know you'll have the time to look at it more. Um, but the more activity you put in LinkedIn, the more visible you are to people. Um, I know if I like one of my connections posts on LinkedIn, uh, it'll tell all of my connections that I liked your post. So that's just another example on how you can be more visible to people. And then we kind of talked about recommendations a little bit. So we'll go over that again. Does anyone have any questions about LinkedIn? about why we have LinkedIn, about what to put in your LinkedIn profile. How do I use LinkedIn for job searching? How do I reach out to contacts? Or if you have any questions about interviewing or job searching, you can also put those in the chat. So the good thing about this webinar today is that, um, you know, this is a opportunity where you can get some career advice for free. So if you ever had um, a moment, you know, in your job search that you're like, man, I'm just really frustrated with my job search and I don't know what to do. Um, you can definitely put specific questions in the chat about that as well. Um, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, I do have my contact information on the screen. So again, my name is Amanda Cost. I work in um, career services for Kishwaukee College. So if you are a student or alumni and you just need some extra help with finding work, maybe you've been out of school for a few years, you can still come to me and I can assist you with that. Um, those services are at no cost to you. And we also have the DeKalb Workforce Development Office, which again, is a really great resource if you're searching for employment. So I know they their service area is um, Cal, Kane, and Kendall. But if you live in Ogle or Lee counties, or you live in a different county, and you still want to know how to get connected with a service like that, you can still contact this office. Um, the great thing about WIOA is that it is a federal grant under the Department of Labor, meaning that it exists in every state, and it certainly exists in every county in Illinois. So um, I'm sure Nicole would be more than willing to assist you with finding where your local workforce development office is, so you can get those services at no cost to you as well. All right, 
So I don't see any other questions. So if there's no other questions, um, I guess my portion is completed. So thank you so much for attending my workshop portion. Um, I hope this information was useful to you. Um, again, my email is on the screen. So if you have any questions um, just about interviewing in general, you can always shoot me an email. Well, thank you, Amanda. That was a really great presentation. I think everybody got a lot out of it. And it's very beneficial. Uh, our next presenter is Eileen Sullivan. Uh, Eileen is from uh, Fiera Candy. She's a recruiter for the Bolingbrook DeKalb location. She's been with Ferrera since 2018 and has been in the recruiting industry since 2007. Her focus has been on food and beverage manufacturing industry. She loves what she does and enjoys helping others find a career and home at Farrah Candy. Eileen, uh, thank you for coming and we'll go ahead and let you do your presentation. Thank you for the introduction, I appreciate it. And thanks everyone for attending today. Um, Amanda, you gave a lot of good tips. And I'd also be happy to answer anyone's questions as, as I go along um, in the chat box. Um, if you have any questions about kind of what I see on a day-to-day -day basis in recruiting, um, I know it can be a difficult process for everyone and people get nervous and things like that. So, you know, being a recruiter, we, we understand that. And a lot of times, <clears throat> you know, we, we can look past that. Um, a lot of times we're really looking more for someone with a positive attitude, someone who's a team player, um, someone who can clearly answer our questions. I would say that's a big thing that um, sometimes people can't do. We get like one word answers um, and people just aren't able to explain what they've done in the past. Um, so just make sure you really are able to talk about your experience um, when you're speaking with an employer. Um, <clears throat> if you're not familiar with Ferrara, um, we've been around since 1908. Um, I'll actually share my screen here. Um, and we originally started as a bakery in Chicago. Um, that bakery eventually turned into candy manufacturing. The bakery is still there in Chicago and running. Um, and we became famous for lemon heads, uh, red hots, trolley gummies, also black forest gummies, um, now and laters. <clears throat> so we've quite a few brands. Um, we also own the Nestle candy plants and we did recently purchase six of the Kellogg's plants. Um, the Kellogg's plants are mainly cookies um, like Girl Scout cookies, Keebler, um, Famous Amos, for example. And then we do have a parent company, which is Ferrero. Um, and they make the Ferrero Rocher chocolates. Uh, a lot of people enjoy those. They also make Nutella um, and they also make Tic Tacs, just a few of their products. Um, <clears throat> and then they also own Fannie Mae. So there's quite a few brands um, all under one umbrella. We have um, our corporate offices in downtown Chicago. And then we have several plants throughout the Chicagoland area. Now, um, DeKalb is a brand new lo location for us. Uh, we recently built it. Um, it's our packaging and distribution center. Um, so that's about 1.2 million square feet. Um, it's a, a state-of-the-art packaging and distribution center. We have about 22 high-speed packaging lines. So we are currently doing a lot of hiring um, in the area. <clears throat> um, some of the positions that we're targeting um, are like packaging assistants, um, sanitation workers um, that help keep our facility clean, like our machines and also the building. Um, we also look for stand-up forklift drivers, uh, maintenance mechanics, quality technicians, and machine operators. Um, those are some of our current openings, uh, but we do also get other positions as well. Um, you can apply on our website for these positions, um, or you can also use the text feature. 
Um, <clears throat> And basically, we are currently doing Zoom interviews for most of our positions. Um, so unfortunately, you know, this pandemic isn't over yet, but hopefully soon. Um, so we're doing Zoom interviews. Um, so if you haven't used Zoom before, um, we typically walk our candidates through that process so they're comfortable with it ahead of time. And we typically attach your resume um, to the invite, so the hiring manager would have that available for them. I know that was a question earlier as far as how to get your resume to the person interviewing you. So that's how we do it. <clears throat> um, and we also have a great benefit package. Um, we have Blue Cross Blue Shield Medical. We have dental, vision, 401k with a match. We do have tuition reimbursement as well. Um, I think it's great to work and get your tuition paid for for free if you can. So it's definitely a great benefit to take advantage of if you are interested in continuing your education. Um, we do pay 11 holidays and we offer two weeks vacation and then three weeks after one year. Um, so the company's really good about staying competitive uh, with benefits. So that's something that you can always feel secure about. We're also a very stable company. Um, candy is just a very stable industry. People always buy it, no matter the state of the economy. So it's not a job where you may get laid off. Um, we don't do layoffs. So <clears throat> even though we are number one in seasonal candy, um, we are busy all throughout the year with our daily candy that people purchase as well. Um, so that's something that you wouldn't have to worry about. There's a lot of stability in the industry. Um, also, we're growing like crazy. So obviously, that's why we opened this new facility. Um, the company is currently going global, and we are launching our candy products in China, uh, Canada, and also the UK. Um, does, and if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to type them in the chat box. Um, as we go along. Um, I know it's a lot of information. So um, any questions, please feel free to ask. I do see, let's see. Okay, no, these are from the previous presentation. So um, I think that's about it um, for our current openings. Um, and I will pass it back to um, Amanda for your next presenter. Hi, this is Ryan. Uh, we'll just get about 30 more seconds. If you have any questions, feel free to enter that into the chat box or the Q&A. Okay. Sorry, my computer is going a little crazy here. <laughs> has a mind of its own, I apologize. <clears throat> I don't see any questions for you. So we will go ahead and go to our next presenter. Our next presenter, presenter is from Ideal Industries. Tom Hanna is a talent acquisition manager. Tom owns all the global recruiting efforts and staffing processes and has been with Ideal for uh, numerous years, about a year and a half. Tom, are you available? I am. Perfect. Thanks for the introduction, Ryan. Go ahead, sir. So with that year and a half of experience at Ideal, there's about 30 plus years of experience prior to that in talent acquisition. So love Ideal Industries. And uh, if there's questions I can answer about talent acquisition, about trying to find a job, please let me know because I, this is a great forum. I'm really pleased with the information that's being shared today um, and how you're approaching the, the job search process. Amanda, I thought you did a great job. So thank you for sharing all that information. Um, in terms of ideal industries, we are a hundred year old family owned professionally managed organization. And we manufacture a variety of different products at our location in Sycamore, Illinois. So we're a local company. 
Um, we're proud of our heritage. We're a very, very values-based sort of organization where we look for people that align very closely with the company culture. Culture is really important to us from the standpoint um, we want to treat people right. We want to have people come and be a part of the organization, grow and stay with the organization over time. So we work hard to try to provide opportunities for people to, to really become a part of the family, for lack of a better term. Um, Having said that, we provide a lot of different benefits to the organization as well. Um, so full medical, dental, vision plans. Uh, we also provide some great uh, retirement plans with a 401k with a 4% match on a 4% employee contribution. Uh, we also provide a cash balance retirement plan, which is targeted at 4% of your base compensation as well. And that is uh, essentially a pension plan, which is something that you don't hear about a lot nowadays. And those are things that are geared towards you coming and staying with the organization for a long period of time. Our goal is for people to come, become a part of the organization, grow with the organization, and experience different things within the organizational culture. So that's just how we approach things. Relative to the opportunities within our locations at present, we have a couple of exempt level positions that are open. Uh, we have a production supervisor position that'll be a, a third shift operation. Uh, operational role, um, and that position is currently open, along with a supplier quality engineer, which is really doing a lot of our uh, materials qualification for incoming uh, materials that are used in our products and, and monitoring that and partnering with the suppliers along the way. So those two roles are currently open today um, and are roles that we are accepting applications for. Um, the positions are both posted online at this point. So you're welcome to uh, to apply to those roles, let us know of your interest. Um, from an email standpoint, I'll share my email with you. And if you do have opportunities that you want to explore, you're welcome to reach out to me directly. My email is tom.hanna at idealindustries.com. Um, kind of a long email, but uh, we, are, we are certainly doing a lot of hiring right now. Now, Adam Roach, uh, who's also online today, um, and Ryan, if we could introduce Adam a bit. Adam is our production manager and is overseeing a lot of our three shift operation in terms of hiring for some of the shift roles as well. And there are roles open on all three shifts currently. So I can turn it over to Adam for him to do a brief overview of what he's got open at the moment to talk a little bit about those roles and the opportunities uh, on the production side of the house. Ryan, can I ask you to... <laughs> Turn it over to Adam. Thank you. Yes, our next presenter is Adam Roach. He's also with Ideal Industries, and he is the production manager. He oversees all production and distribution efforts, and has been with Ideal for almost five years. Adam, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm excited to have the opportunity to, uh, to interact with all of you today. This is a really cool experience, and uh, I'm excited that there are opportunities like this out there. Um, Thanks, Tom, for giving a, a general overview of Ideal Industries. Um, as mentioned, I'm our production manager, so I'm the hiring manager for a lot of the roles that we have open right now. Um, uh, I oversee our manufacturing facility here in Sycamore, along with our distribution center um, just down the road uh, from our, our manufacturing plant and another one out in Irwindale, California. Um, as Tom mentioned, we're a multi-shift operation and we're, we're, we're continuously looking for new members to, to bring on to our team so we can continue to grow our business. Um, at right now, we've got a variety of roles, pretty much um, a, a gamut of, it runs the gamut of all of the different opportunities within our operation um, from operator one, um, which would be coming in and performing some packing and light assembly work, um, potentially running some, some automated assembly equipment, tending to them, performing quality inspections, um, that sort of thing. Um, could be working on an assembly line to be building tools or putting together kits. Um, or potentially performing some, some packing operations. Um, operator twos, um, which is, includes everything that's within the operator one, uh, along with tending to some more advanced uh, assembly equipment, um, operation of forklifts, um, some light fabrication work, um, could be a little bit of setup work as well. Um, so um, some problem solving skills are, are, are crucial in, in that role. Um, Machine operator one. So that's a little bit more advanced of an operator position. Uh, that's where we bring in our molding operators and uh, the folks that run our molding machines. So we've got a, 
a large portion of our facility um, that dedicated to molding components to make wire, wire connectors. So we make twist on wire connectors and push in style wire connectors and ballast disconnects that would be in all of our light fixtures. Um, we make all those right here in Sycamore from, from uh, raw materials. Um, all the whole value stream is done right here uh, from winding the springs that go in them to, to molding the actual shells that, that we would assemble here in on site. Um, so uh, that would be overseeing the process. Um, so um, adjusting temperatures, timing, things like that, um, performing the machine setup and, and some fabrication is work, work as well. Could be running some stamping machines um, or getting to, into some die casting, uh, different roles like that. Um, also black oxide, we, we do uh, treat some of our metals on site as well. Um, we have likely will be having a tool and die maker position come up. Uh, we have an opening now, but we, I think we were close to filling uh, that, but um, I think we're going to be continuing to add to our team in terms of our tool and die uh, group. So we have a full tool room um, that oversees the tooling of our equipment. Um, and we, we do have some programs um, for apprenticeship that we, we offer every once in a while. So we've got one apprentice right now that, that was one of our molding operators that developed in that that's actually going to school at Kish, um, is working through that apprenticeship. Um, and once he finishes that, we'll be, we'll be looking for another person to, to be pushing through there as well. Um, there are also various material handler roles. Um, so um, material handler is, is kind of a broad statement here at Ideal. Um, we like to give a lot of opportunities to our employees to be able to cross train and do multiple things. So a material handler could be performing some re receiving activities, uh, managing a dock, loading and unloading trucks. They could be working as a water spider, pulling materials from one production cell to another, um, or they could be working in our distribution center, actually fulfilling customer orders. Um, working on a reach truck um, to be able to, to perform replenishment um, and uh, be packaging out and shipping orders uh, both domestically and internationally. Um, then uh, Tom also mentioned that we're looking for a supervisor. That one's near and dear to my heart uh, because I'm performing my job and the job of a supervisor as well. Um, we've got a couple on my team, but looking to add another person. Um, so uh, actively recruiting for that. Um, and with all of the different roles that we have, um, you know, we look for, for trans, transferable skills. It doesn't necessarily have to be experienced within our industry. Um, the, I, the way I look, like to look at it, if, if a candidate brings the will, we'll train the skill. Um, so we'll, we'll give them the opportunities to learn and develop um, in role. Um, but look for any type of tran, uh, transferable skills, people who might have operated equipment before um, or folks who, um, you know, are just looking to be cross trained um, or, um, have a high energy, um, you know, uh, change, look into change industries, maybe somebody who was in the service industry. We've re recently had quite a few folks who have been in the service industry and with everything happening with the pandemic, we're looking for a career change and their skills translate great to some of our molding operations where you've got to be on task and be managing your time effectively and prioritizing yourself um, to ensure that you keep multiple machines up and running at, at, at any given time. Um, so, uh, you know, with that, it really is just someone who is looking to be able to share their experiences. And as you're interviewing, I think Eileen mentioned this as well. Um, often people, people will sell themselves short. You know, they'll say, yes, I've done that. Or this is what I've, what, what tasks I've, I've, I did in a position, but they don't really um, speak to their experience in that role, what it's helped them excel. And most importantly, what, what satisfied them in past positions or didn't, because the most important piece in, in our hiring process is trying to find the right fit for somebody. Um, you know, we want someone to, to get into a position that they're really going to enjoy doing and they're going to be able to um, continue to grow with the organization um, and kind of follow a, a path that they can, um, you know, work together with each other to collaborate and uh, continue to, to, to grow. So that's kind of, you know, what we're, we're looking for in terms of our recruiting process. Um, and if anybody has any, any questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat. I'm more than happy to share my experiences and my perspective on hiring um, and the market that we have today. Thank you, Adam. Uh, we'll just give a quick 30 seconds to 60 seconds for anyone who has a question for Adam or for Tom, you may enter it into the Q&A or chat feature. Um, uh, and so they'll, they'll be around here for a little bit longer if you have any questions. Our final employee presenter today is from the Sutter Company. Her name is Samantha Daly. She's the human resources manager. Uh, she has 
uh, over 25 years of human resources experience and has lived and worked in the Sycamore community during that time. She's a commissioner with the Sycamore Fire and Police Commission, a volunteer for Mills on Wheels, and a youth, youth mentor through the Family Service Agency. Uh, Samantha, go ahead and give your presentation. All right, thank you very much. I'm so excited to be here today, and it's just been a pleasure listening to all the presentations, and it's, a, it's an honor to be a part of the group. So again, my um, thank you so much for inviting us to be a part of this presentation. So at this point, what I'd like to do is uh, share a little bit more about the Suter Company and um, what it is that we do. So bear with me a minute as I uh, get set up here. All right, so um, we know that right now there are lots of opportunities for job seekers. There are companies all over the community that are offering positions. And so what we wanna do today is to tell you a little bit more about who the Suter Company is and why you should consider joining our company. So the Suter Company has been around since 1925 and we are a food manufacturer and we make different types of food products, different types of protein salads and dips. So things like chicken salad, tuna salad, ham salad. Our customers um, include businesses like Panera, Sam's, Walmart, Aldi's, Bumblebee. So some really well-known companies. We actually have food products across the country. So, you know, all of that in this little town here in Sycamore, both of our plants are both uh, based in the Sycamore community. So we're, we're very, very local. Um, as I mentioned, we've been around since 1925, a very, very long time. We recently became an ESOP. So what that means is that anybody who joins our company now is an owner. So that's a wonderful thing. And it's a wonderful benefit, and a wonderful retirement benefit for those individuals that stay with us on a long-term basis. So we're very, very excited about the fact that uh, we are indeed an ESOP. And as I said, when you join our company, uh, you're not only an employee, but you're also an owner. Uh, we work very, very hard at creating an environment that allows you to feel like you're a part of a family so that you're not just an employee member, but you're a part of something that is much bigger than that. So when we have somebody come on board with us, we look at taking care of you in a um, in a way that you've probably never been taken care of before. And I certainly hope that everybody can see my screen. So hopefully I did that correctly. I guess just get a thumbs up that everybody can see my screen. All right, I'm gonna count that as good. So um, we do everything we can to take care of our employees in a way, as I said, that you, uh, a person has probably never been taken care of before. So we offer all of the traditional benefits that you'd expect in terms of competitive wages, um, insurance benefits like medical, dental, vision, disability, life, all of those types of things. We also offer a fitness center that is over here on the corner of my slide. That's an on-site fitness center that's free to all of our employees. Um, we also, as I said, um, are an ESOP, and that's a wonderful retirement benefit that's available to all of our employees and, and can mean um, a substantial financial benefit when somebody has been with us for a long term, uh, on a long term period and then ends up retiring with us. So not only do we offer all of these things, but there's so many more things that we offer. And we know that um, when job seekers are looking for work, many individuals are looking for something for, that's much more than just a job. They're looking for a place where they can call it home, um, a place that they can come to on an ongoing basis and feel valued and respected and appreciated. We know that job seekers in many cases are looking for ways that they can give back to the community, that they can grow as a human. And so what we want to do with some of our additional benefits is provide all of those opportunities. Um, what I've got in the middle of our screen right here is a compass. And uh, this compass displays all of the core values of our organization. So you can see this, this compass, this compass has a meaning for us because this is our guiding force. This is where it helps us to know what direction we're going and make sure that we stay on the right path. In the center of this is the word respect. And as I mentioned earlier, we wanna make sure that all of our employees are treated with respect and integrity. And so every conversation that we have centers around making sure that we're respecting each other. Some of our other core values include integrity, extraordinary care, radical generosity, better every day and customer success. And then some of the little pictures that I've got around my screen actually represent 
those different core values. So I mentioned earlier that we know that many people want the opportunity to not only work at a job, but have the opportunity to give back to a community. And so um, since we are a local community, we actually have a, a calendar that gives employees an opportunity to be a part of a volunteer um, event every single month of the year. In fact, this coming Saturday, there's a group of us that are gonna be cleaning up the gardens at the Pay It Forward House. And over here on the right side of my screen is a smaller picture that shows a group of individuals that um, did a 5K recently and raised money for children with cancer. So giving back to the community is very near and dear to the employees here at the Souter Company. One of our big events is Feed My Starving Children. So the Souter Company is a host of a mobile Feed My Starving Children event that happens every November. And during that event, we have over 5,000 volunteers who come on site, who pack meals to feed over one and a half million starving children around the world. And what a wonderful opportunity. And our employees are fantastic. They get involved in this. It's a four day event. We shut down. Employees are here volunteering, organizing, directing traffic, setting up, cleaning up, you name it. We've got an incredible group of people and uh, who just want to give back and make the world a better place. Um, a couple of other opportunities that we have here at the company would be a, um, a program called Financial Peace University. And we recognize at the Souter Company that very often, if our finances are a wreck, well, that means the rest of our life can tend to be a wreck. So what we try and do is we give, um, we offer a program called Financial Peace University, and it allows individuals some guidance and direction in terms of establishing a budget, establishing a savings plan, developing that emergency, um, you know, that emergency fallback plan. So all of those things, we offer that both in the fall and spring semester for our employees. Souter U is a um, continuing education program that we offer to all of our employees. It, um, this program offers a variety of different classes that range from very fun classes like painting, uh, classes about astronomy, or some more uh, business related classes like learning um, uh, Spanish as a second language, learning about Excel and Word and some more business uh, type of skills. Up on the top right um, is a reference to a program uh, that we have here at the company called Marketplace Chaplain. So we know that spiritual support is very important to our employees. So we have chaplains who walk around our facilities on a regular basis, just being present, offering support as needed. Um, and then finally, one of the most exciting programs that we offer here at the company is a program called the Dream Manager. And with the Dream Manager, um, it is, uh, we basically have individuals who, off, uh, who operate as life coaches for our employees. And what they will do is they meet with employees on uh, any employee who is interested in the program. And, and we know that we all have dreams and we all have things that we're working towards. And what our dream managers do is they help those individuals who are interested in the program to identify their dream or their goals and then plot a path towards achieving that particular dream. And then finally, uh, what I did want to share with you is what our current openings are. So like uh, we, we have a one, uh, number of openings. We're in a great position because we are a growing company and we have positions open on our first and second shift for assemblers. Uh, we have openings for sanitation workers and maintenance techs. All of these openings on our, are on our website with our pay uh, as well. And then certainly as, as the other presenters have offered, I am available for any questions or support or um, guidance that you may need as you go about your job search. Um, my name is Samantha Daly and my email address is sdaily at suterco.com. So once again, thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of the program and, and we certainly hope that you will consider the Suter company as you go about your job search. Thank you, Samantha. That was, uh, that was excellent. So we are uh, in, nearing the end of our presentation. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions for Representative Tom Demmer or Representative Jeff Kiker, their contact information is in the chat box. Uh, their emails are very simple. It's last name at islehousegop.org. So it's Demmer at islehousegop.org and Kiker at islehousegop.org. We greatly appreciate everybody taking time out of their day to participate in today's pres presentation. Uh, 
Uh, we hope it was helpful for you. Uh, and uh, if you have, once again, if you have any questions, you may contact the legislative office um, of Representative Jeff Kiker or Representative Tom Demmer. Uh, we have a hand raise, it looks like. Uh, if you could, we'll give you a couple more seconds to write your question either in the Q&A feature or the chat box. Uh, we just have thank you for this information. Well, thank you, Tom. That's hopefully it was good for you. Let me check one more time in the Q&A. Do not see anything else current. So, well, thank you, everyone. That concludes today's presentation. Uh, hopefully, it's beneficial to you. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact the legislative offices of Representative Demmer or Kaiker. Thank you.